this service may we know you may we know what it is to call you friend we take a moment right now to repent for anything that we may have said anything that we may have done this month this week this year five minutes ago that may have grieved your holy spirit that may have may have gone against the word of god we repent right now And we ask for your forgiveness, we ask for your grace, and we ask for your mercy. Father God, we ask that you forgive us and you purge us from all unrighteousness. Sit on the table of our hearts this morning. Sit on the table of our hearts this morning and inscribe on our hearts. Inscribe on our hearts your words, your will, your purpose. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We say that we're listening. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. If we can stay in the spirit of worship, don't start having conversations. You may be seated, amen. Stay in this spirit, amen. Get your Bibles out if you can. We've got a lot of ground to cover and I'm going to go as quickly as I can. There was so much to unpack in this that I really struggled what to leave in and what to take out. So just a disclaimer from the beginning, this is in no way a complete picture of the Holy Spirit or what it is to live a Holy Spirit-filled life. I simply do not have enough time to break this whole subject apart. So I've just literally pulled out the key elements of what I feel that we need to be able to begin this journey So the title of my message today is Living a Holy Spirit-Filled Life. Turn to your neighbor and say, Living a Holy Spirit-Filled Life. Turn with me, if you can, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. In Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Go down slightly to verse 26 
of the same chapter, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. And it says, then God said, let us make man in our, underline that word, our image, according to our, again, our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We're just laying a foundation at the moment. Flip your pages, if you can, to John chapter 15, verse 26. John chapter 15, verse 26. John chapter 15, verse 26, and it says... But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, this is Jesus speaking, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So what we get from this portion of scripture, and can the cafe guys get my um, my thing ready? Okay, they've got it ready. Okay, good. Um, What we see from these scriptures is there is multiple people being spoken about here. So there's one God manifested as three persons. So in John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus is saying a help is going to come, but then he also talks about his father. So we know that there is actually a father, there is a helper, which is the Holy Spirit, and there's Jesus Christ, the Son. This is called the Trinity. It's one God three persons. Now, a lot of people struggle with this concept or this understanding of the Trinity. So I want to show this to you if we can. This is the easiest way that I thought, you know, I see in pictures, right? And I have to do an illustration at some point in my sermon. So I've got water three different ways. So I've got a jug of water. Yes. I've got ice, also made from water, and then I've got steam that's going up as a vapor, also water. It's the same substance, but it's manifested in three different ways. Nothing about the water has changed except for the way that it is manifested. So it's manifested as ice, it's manifested as just water, and it's manifested as vapor. We have Father God, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The same way, these are all water, but manifested in different ways, is the same way we have the Father God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are all the same but manifested in different ways. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about the Trinity, we know that there is one God but three persons. In John chapter 16, verses 7 to 8, you don't need to turn there, you can just write it down. And again in verses 13 to 15, where Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit, he refers to him as him and he 12 times. So what that says to me is the Holy Spirit is not some cloud in the sky. He's not simply just a vapor. He's a person. The same way that Jesus Christ was a person. We also see in Matthew 28, 19, that um, in the great baptismal formula directly from Jesus, where he tells his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have these three beings that are also the Godhead. The Apostle Paul uses the same formula again in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, where he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So the first thing that we need to understand is, number one, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. And we need to realize that as he's part of the Trinity, he is divine, he is holy, he is to be reverenced and to be respected. We are not dealing with an impersonal force, he's not an it, he is not a ghost, he is not a quality of divine essence, he is a person, just as Jesus was a person and he has a personality. 
He's not an influence. You do not grow in relationship with an influence or a feeling. We may, what may influence you today may not influence you tomorrow. The Holy Spirit is not an influence or an influencer. He's not a trend or an idea. He is a person. You can also grieve the Holy Spirit. You can sin against the Holy Spirit. You can anger the Holy Spirit. You can lie against the Holy Spirit. You can, you can um, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. And this is the only time in Scripture where the Bible says that if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever wondered why? Or do you just read that Scripture and just keep going? Because the Holy Spirit is the channel to Jesus. He is the one that convicts. He is the one that restores. He's the one that brings about that born again salvation relationship. It's the Holy Spirit that will bring you to the point of recognizing I need a savior. If you harden your heart to the Holy Spirit, you have literally cut off your source to Jesus Christ. And therefore, salvation cannot be given to you. Things that grieve the Holy Spirit. When we fail to show reverence and respect. When we come into church late. One thing that you've got to realize is God doesn't just show up when we walk in the door. The Father God, the Son... And the Holy Spirit are actually waiting for us. When it hits 10 o'clock, they're already here. When the worship begins to go up, they are waiting for the audience with us. When we come in in the middle of that, they're already here. It's grievous to the Holy Spirit when we disregard his presence in that manner. When we don't reverence their presence enough to have the decency to be on time. If you received an invitation from the, the king today, he's not king yet, well he kind of is, well, he hasn't been, you know what I mean, it's going to come in May. But if we received an invitation from the king or someone that we would regard as quite high up, we would make sure that we were actually there slightly early. I would hope if you were going for a job interview, you would rock up at least 20 minutes early. Because you don't know where you need to go, you don't know what the parking's like, you would arrive early. Why? Because it looks very bad if you walk in and you're late. That's your first impression. When we go to the theater, we know that if we don't get there on time, they will close the doors and we will miss the show. We don't want to forfeit our 40 pound or 60 pound or 120 pound ticket, so we will make sure we're there on time. So why is it when we come into the presence of God, we don't show the same reverence? Because somewhere along the line, we have failed to have a revelation of the sovereignty of the presence of God. Because if we truly, truly understood the presence of God, we would be so careful not only when we got here, but how we enter. We would be conscious of anything that we would possibly do to offend or shift this presence from moving. When we understand the sovereignty of the presence of God, it's impossible to stand in worship and not partake. How can you? This is the king of all the universe, the maker of heaven and earth, the lily of the valley, the brightest morning star, the author and the finisher. And we, we can't lift our hands. We'll go to the gym. 
will put our body under subjection. I'm not that person, but a lot of you are. We will almost punish our bodies, but then when we get into the presence of God to lift our hands, what angle is this? Not even fully. We struggle with that. We will take part in conversations while worship is going on. I, I stood at the side here while the announcements was going on, and there were so many conversations happening. Everywhere, there was so much movement. It was like little ants. And that's why I had to bring up the worship team to bring back. Because the Holy Spirit is so easily grieved, he can leave. When we fail to show reverence and respect, talking on our phones, checking our phones, the words that come out of our mouth, ungodly conversations, unkind behavior, fighting with our spouse right up until the door, disunity in our home and in the church, the conditions of our hearts. These are the things that grieve the Holy Spirit. You and I need to cultivate an inner sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that does not depend on the evidence of our physical senses. When our senses tell us that there's nothing about his presence or even that they may be seen to deny it, there should be an area in the innermost parts of our own spirit that maintains an uninterrupted awareness of the Holy Spirit's presence. There should never be a time where we are not aware that the Holy Spirit is with us and in us. It should be a constant reality. Everywhere we go, every conversation we have, we are God's glory carriers. We carry and we house the glory of God. Therefore, I can't just go anywhere, do anything, have any conversation because I'm constantly aware of this reality. So the Holy Spirit is divine. He is to be honored and reverend. The Holy Spirit does not have a preference or favorites. We're still laying a foundation. He is sent to everyone who will welcome him. He doesn't have a preference between black, white, Indian, Asian, tall, short, male, female, if you will create an atmosphere where the presence of God can dwell, the Holy Spirit will come. Amen? He is the one that draws us to Christ. If we resist the Holy Spirit, then we harden our hearts, which means that we, there is no more repentance, which is why it's the unforgivable sin. You cannot truly understand Christianity and all that it entails without understanding and knowing the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. It's imperative for this generation to understand and know who he is, what he is, and what he will do for you. It's essential for our Christian walk that we have a working, visible relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. This morning when you woke up, how many of you said good morning? How many of you said good morning to your spouse when they were, when they were lying next to you? How would you feel if your spouse woke up in the morning and just got on with their business? Didn't say hello to you, didn't say good morning, even until now they haven't said hello to you. Would you feel great? The Holy Spirit is literally sitting there waiting for you to wake up. And if you allow him to, he will actually be the one that wakes you up. Do you know that? I actually, when I wake up, I smile because I can feel him just, I'm like, what is it? I can feel him in the room with me. I was saying to pastor last night, I can't even explain it, but I can literally, even though my physical eyes can't see him, I can tell you the exact spot of where he's sitting. And I can see him just sitting there going, come on. I can feel the Holy Spirit waiting for me to wake up. And it's got to the point now where my alarm doesn't need to go off. He's my alarm. So the most natural thing when I open my eyes in the morning is, good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good morning, Heavenly Father. 
Can we implement that into our morning and our evening routine? Good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Good morning, Lord Jesus, the Trinity. They're all there and they're all present at all times. Turn with me, if you can, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. You okay this morning? Did you have your porridge? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. I can't believe I didn't get my porridge this morning. I'm not angry. Abike actually took the last one. <laughs> I took her order not knowing that I was actually giving her my, my, the last porridge, but I'm not upset. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. She's blaming it on the kids or Kabir or someone. <laughs> Kabir is looking like, I never had no porridge. Porridge is not in my belly. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 1 to 2, and it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Um, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Read that one more time, verse 3. It says, therefore I've made, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And no one, say no one. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Do you know how deep that is? That means without the Holy Spirit, I want you to get this because I feel like the Holy Spirit is sometimes the most underrated and unspoken person of the Trinity. Without the Holy Spirit, guys, you don't get to go to heaven. That's going to drop for somebody around Monday at 12 o'clock. Without the Holy Spirit, you don't get to see Jesus. So it's in your best interest to get to know him. He is the key that unlocks your relationship with Jesus Christ. So it's really important that we are comfortable with who the Holy Spirit is. And we are willing, willing to allow him to make us uncomfortable about our lives. Because it's his role to convict And transform us to fill us and empower us for ministry. It's his role to testify through us to the message of Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. It's his job to show us the need for repentance and the acceptance of the gracious gift of salvation. That's the Holy Spirit's job. To lead us to Jesus. To teach us and equip us with everything that we need to live this Christian life. Turn with me, if you can, to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. We're still laying foundation. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, and he says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. What does this mean? He brings life to what is dead. Our sin nature was made us dead. We, are walk, we were walking dead people. What does that mean? Is that the zombie uh, movie where we're all now walking around as corpses? No, we were spiritually dead. We were walking dead people. But through the impartation of the Holy Spirit, He comes into us and he gives us the gift of the born again salvation. He is the one, the Bible says that he is the one that leads us to repentance. When you're sitting in a room like this, it is the Holy Spirit that will grab hold of your heart and let you know that you need a savior. He is the one that brings about life to what was dead. That spirit lives on the inside of us. So let's look at some of these characteristics and attributes of the Holy Spirit. Number one, he is the one that distributes the gifts. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. You should all kind of already be there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
And it says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God, that Trinity, who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, um, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. These gifts are given by the will of the Holy Spirit to help you, to lead you, and to guide you. If you want any of these gifts, you all, all you need to simply do is ask. The Holy Spirit, and we're going to get there in a minute, is indwelled on the inside of you. He has these gifts and he distributes it as, his will, as he wills. If you want any of these gifts, so if you want wisdom, ask. If you want discernment, ask. All of these gifts, the working of miracles, the healing, healing, all of these gifts, he has it. All we have to do is ask. There is so much of the Holy Spirit that we don't tap into today because we don't ask. We're not walking with him. We're not talking with him. We're not doing life with him. Number two, he's omnipresent. When we say that God is omnipresent, we mean that he is present everywhere at the same time. In Jeremiah 23 to, um, to 24, God himself affirms this. In Psalms 139 verses 7 to 12, David says that if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. So no matter where we go, no matter where we go, he says, even if I go to the depths of hell and make my bed there, which some of you have done, you went and took your sleeping bag. No one sent you. You went and brought wahala on your own head because you didn't listen. Because you decided to put the Holy Spirit over here and you're going to go do your own thing. But the Holy Spirit says, I don't stay there. So even if you go and make your bed in the very depths of hell, I'm there right there with you. And all we need to do to get out of that hell is to turn around to the Holy Spirit and say, get me out. But so many times we want to do it our own way. We want to carve our own path where they're shoveling and heaving and pushing. And God's like, um, there's steps. There's steps. I already ordained your path. I already made your way straight. But we want to date the bad boy. We want to experience the world. We want to put our feet in the water. And then we carry the sorrow of those decisions. Life without the Holy Spirit is a hard path. He is all-knowing. He is all-wise. Go to the Holy Spirit. Stop trying to do things in your own strength. Some of you are so busy trying to make the money, the money, the money. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things shall be added to you. Do you notice that the more you chase money, the more it runs from you? 
You're working on Sundays, you're working on Mondays, you're working every hour, and the, the money, it's like, it's like a sieve in your hands. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. So no matter where we go, God is there by his spirit, invisible, often inescapable, but for the unbeliever, this might sound like a terrifying thought. Gosh, everywhere I go, this Holy Spirit's with me, yep. But for the believer that's living right, it should be a comfort, it should be an assurance that no matter where we find ourselves, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. He will never leave you nor forsake you. We see this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. So regardless of what you're facing today, regardless of how dark it looks, regardless of how bleak it looks, regardless of how barren it feels, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will never leave you nor forsake you, even till the end of this age. So there is nothing that you are facing today that the Holy Spirit is not there with you, empowering you. Number four. He empowers you. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Turn there with me if you can. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You still okay? Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. We might actually go over to chapter 1 first. Let's go to chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 first. And it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we see as well that in um, Acts chapter 1 where he anoints them, the Holy Spirit anoints them to be able to preach the gospel, to be able to declare um, the kingdom of God. Second Timothy chapter to 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So what does he empower you with? He empowers you with boldness. He empowers you to preach the gospel. He empowers you to move in the Holy Spirit. He empowers you to get people saved. Because in your own strength and in your own ability, you can't do any of those things. Me, by myself, I'm a very introverted person. People say that I'm not. I know I am. I don't like big crowds. I don't like public speaking. I don't like any of those things. But with the Holy Spirit, who Sarah Jane is is no longer relevant. Who the power is within me all of a sudden is all that counts. This is not me. This, if you know me, this is not me. I would rather any day of the week let somebody else, I'll sit there, I'll take notes, I'll do all of it, I'll be in the background, I'll be in the cafe, I'll be somewhere else, but this is not me. But I also understand that he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to set at liberty those that are captive. He has anointed me. It's through his power, not by my might, not by my strength, but by his power that I'm able to do, do what I do. It's by his might and his power that you will see somebody that does not know Jesus Christ and words will begin to fill your mouth. That's the Holy Spirit. It's by his power that you will walk past someone on the street and where you would normally be very shy and very scared to approach them, the Holy Spirit will empower you to go up. It's by his power that you will be able to lay hands on people and they will recover. It's the Holy Spirit that gives you that power. Galatians 5.22 speaks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that will enable you to manifest this fruit. A peace that surpasses understanding does not come from ourselves. Love, joy, 
peace, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The reason why many of us struggle with manifesting these fruits is because we're trying to do it in our own strength and in our own ability. We need to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that will give us the power to love the unlovely. It's the Holy Spirit that will give us the power to remain faithful when we don't want to anymore. It's the Holy Spirit that comes and changes lives. He anoints, He transforms. It's not our own self. When you are believing for that spouse, that family member, invite the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts and moves people to repentance. Stop talking and start praying. I will say that one more time because it didn't hit you. If you're falling asleep, shake yourself on, wake yourself up. Don't let your spirit fall asleep in church. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers. It's the Holy Spirit that transforms. So stop nagging your husband. Stop nagging your wife. Stop nagging your children. Go to the Holy Spirit. Say to the Holy Spirit, move through this home. While they sleep, Holy Spirit, begin to come in and touch them. Begin to invite the Holy Spirit into your home. As for me and my house, we will serve the living God. This house shall be a house of prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit. Create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit can dwell. When you're nagging, when you're moaning, when you're going on, the Holy Spirit can't move in that. But what he can move is somebody that begins to cry out for him. What he can move on is somebody that begins to invite him into those spaces. Zechariah 4.6, turn there if you can with me. Zechariah 4.6 is one of my favorite scriptures. He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Some of you need to put that up somewhere high where you can see it. Stop trying to do things in your own might and in your own strength and in your own ability. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Prayer changes things. The Holy Spirit convicts hearts. If there's something that you've been struggling with over and over again, you need to learn to give it to the Holy Spirit. Number five, he comforts and he helps you. He's a teacher. The word comforter is derived from the Greek word advocate or one that helps alongside. It says in, um, let me just see the scripture. It says in John 14 verse 26, John chapter 14 verse 26, that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. He said, but the help of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I said to you. The Holy Spirit's primary purpose is to magnify, glorify, and exalt the Son and to God's glory manifest in our lives. He will teach you the ways of God and the mysteries of the Word. If you struggle to read your Bible or to understand it, invite the Holy Spirit to come. If you, um, instead of Googling um, on the internet what this means or what this word means, we are a generation. I, I actually saw somewhere the other day that I'm so glad that I was a generation that lived before social media. I'm actually really sad for my children. They will never know what it is to run to the toilet quickly during the ads because you will miss the show. They pause it now. They will never know what it is to have a cassette tape and, and that, that feeling when the, 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 the um, tape begins to, and you're quickly there with your pen. <laughs> These lot are looking at me like. And you wind that back because, and when it gets chewed in the recorder, and you're like, no. Because there's no copy. To when I actually want to know something about the Bible, I actually have to open it. There's so much being lost. 
to carry a Walkman around. So cool. To have to communicate before we leave the house because there's no way of contacting anyone. To have to be at that point that you've said that you will be because if you don't get there, they won't know that you're not coming. Stop Googling. Start studying. The Holy Spirit is there to be your guide. I know that everything is just so easy. But not everything's on this. It's not all on this. It's in here. Shut off the noise. It's in here. I remember when I was in school, and maths was just that subject that he might as well have got up and just spoke Japanese. I didn't know what the man was saying. And I'd done my GCSE exam, and I think I got like a F. It was the lower end of the alphabet, let's just put it that way. And so I had to retake math. And I remember sitting there during my maths class, and again... Literally, it just, it just felt like Greek. There was just no, there was no understanding. And then one day I just said, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. And I'm not lying. Within seconds, it was like a light bulb just came on. And everything that I saw and everything that was being said I just understood it. I sat through my exams, and again, I'd say, Holy Spirit, help me. And it was almost like having someone sit next to you and go, no, 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 write that, no, 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 cross that out. And I would literally be like, okay. I went from a (laughs) to a B. Don't ask me how. (laughs) Only the Holy Spirit. He was better than any tutor, any math teacher, any school status. If we would just ask the Holy Spirit. The other day, Maya, was she, she lost her school bag again. And every parent will know the pain of the lost school bag. The children, you're seeing a school bag, we're seeing about 50 pounds. Yeah, the pencil case, the bag, all the contents of the bag. So I say, find the bag. Maya, find the bag. Don't come home without the bag, Maya. So day one. Day two. I said, Maya, it's not acceptable. And then the Holy Spirit challenged me. And I said, why don't we pray? So we prayed and we said, Holy Spirit, help Maya to find the bag. She comes bounding out of school that day. Mommy, I found the bag. I said, did you say thank you to the Holy Spirit? I'll do it now. What are we doing? We're teaching. We're passing on the person of the Holy Spirit. When I was a makeup artist and I used to work for Mac, yes, I was qualified I had the certifications and the training or whatever. But there was never a day that I ever touched someone's face that I didn't say, God, anoint my hands. Anoint my hands, Father God. Up my skill. Take me to another level, but also let them feel your presence when I touch their face. It doesn't matter what sphere you work in. It doesn't matter what you're doing. The Holy Spirit can help you. It doesn't matter how many degrees you hold. It doesn't match the wisdom and the magnitude and the intellect of the Holy Spirit. Invite him in. Nothing is hidden from him. He's all-knowing. Number six, he guides you and directs you. Romans 8.14 says, For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 
As many that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Who is leading you today? It's a genuine question. Who is leading you today? When you go to purchase that house, do you just use Google and right move? Or does the Holy Spirit guide you? What about the area that you live in? Is it based on emotions and feelings? Or is it based on the leading of the Holy Spirit? The school that your children attend. Are you, do you have a 10-year plan and your children are just falling into that 10-year plan? Or are you being guided by the Holy Spirit? The person you are dating. 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 The person you are talking to. What you're feeling right now, that's the Holy Spirit. The person you're dating. The person that you think you want to marry. The job you're taking. Where you work. Are we the ones steering the ship of our hearts and our lives? With our own desires, wants and wills? Or is God and the Holy Spirit and the, the, and the Son the ones doing the directing? Sometimes God will lead us into spaces and places that are uncomfortable and they're not necessarily the prettiest. It doesn't always make sense to our mind. But when God is doing something, it doesn't have to make sense because he's already gone ahead and he's already seen the end. It's for us to get into alignment. When Archie was a puppy, my dog, I've got a dog. His name's Archie. He's a, he's a wonderful dog. He's like, a, he's like Lassie. He's just the most amazing dog. And when Archie was a puppy, he was literally the cutest thing. But when we went to take him for a walk for the first time, he did not like it at all. So what he would do is while we were walking behind him, he would be pulling. And then he would start trying to bite the, the back of our heels to make us to stop leading him. But we had to teach him because when it, any, it's probably the wrong crowd. But when you get a dog, you have to train them how to walk on the lead. They don't naturally do it. Okay, so Archie would be, and he would, he would get so angry with us because we were making his little legs walk. He didn't want to walk, he wanted to be carried. And so we would do it every single day, and eventually Archie started walking next to us. And then eventually when we would take the lead out, he would be the one waiting at the door, wagging his tail. And even today, if he even sees that the lead has come out, he darts to the door and he's ready for his walk. But somewhere along the process, he had to be taught how to be led. Some of us are like the puppy Archie. We nip at God's heels. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want this around my neck. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to not fornicate. I don't want to. I don't want to. How dare she say that I shouldn't be late for church? You don't know. I, you don't know what my morning was like. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, those will be the sons and the daughters of God. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it challenges you, even when everything in you wants to rebut against it. You have to get to a place of trust with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you're saying not to go there, okay. If you're saying not to date that person, okay. If you're saying not to get into that business deal, okay. I don't need a list of, of why. Just the fact that you've said no, that's enough for me. 
John 16, 13 says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. He is all-knowing. He sees beyond what you can see. Number seven, he convicts. When the Holy Spirit is there, there is liberty. He gives us the, um, he gets us out of the bondage of sin. If we are constantly struggling with sin in our lives, it's because the Holy Spirit has been muted somewhere. If you are constantly struggling with sin in your life, it's because the Holy Spirit has been muted somewhere. He's been stopped from speaking into your life. Turn with me to John chapter 16, verses 7 to 8. 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 And it says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It's his job to convict you. Stop running from the conviction. If it doesn't feel right, then stop doing it. Stop justifying it. That, 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 that clenching that you feel, that check that you feel, that's the Holy Spirit telling you, go, move, move away. Don't go down that road. You know that what you're doing is wrong. Stop justifying it. Be led by the Spirit of God. Number eight, he anoints you. Luke 4.18 says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. He anoints you. When the spirit of God comes on you. He anoints you to do things that in your own strength. And in your own ability you would never be able to do. I was sharing this scripture with the youth last week. In 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Turn there quickly if you can with me. 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 20 to 21. And for me, this is goals. He said, then Elisha died and they buried him. He was dead. Say he was dead. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. We're in verse 21 of 2 Kings 13. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was led down and touched the bones of Elijah, he he revived and stood on his feet. You guys don't understand. You're so calm. You're so calm. Does the the word of God like burn in you? Oh, I'm trying to stay calm because, yeah. To have an anointing so severe, so intense, it's in my bones. To the point where my spirit has left. And by just someone touching the residue of what was left of me, it brings life. You're not ready. The bones, the remains of what was left of the man of God was so intense that it literally brought back to life somebody that we don't even know whether they qualified or not. What anointing are you carrying? When you walk into the room, Alive, no remains, alive, with your breath and your body. What happens when you walk into a room? See, my Bible says when the Holy Spirit, and we're going to get there in a minute, when the Holy Spirit is indwelling on the inside of me, that means if I walk into a room, 
and there are people that are sick, as I pass them, if the Spirit of God is truly living on the inside of me in the capacity that he should be, if there is someone that is suicidal, by me walking past them, depression should leave. If I, if I am operating in the capacity of the Holy Spirit, if someone is, has sickness in their body, just by my presence in the room, sickness has to go. When was the last time we made a demand, or when was the ever time that we made a demand on the manifest presence of God in that capacity, that when I walk into the room, atmospheres shift because of the presence that I carry. You don't get it. You don't understand it. And that's why you won't touch it. When you get to the place where it's a demand, where you want it more than you want your breath, more than you want your food, that's when you'll begin to see the manifest presence of God in your life. But you have to want it. You have to desire it. You have to even know that it's a thing. Number nine, he indwells you. The Holy Spirit can and will come into you and indwell you. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you will keep my judgments and do them. Do you know that you are the temple of the most high God and the spirit of God dwells in you? If you can for a second get your head around the thought of your body housing God. Just allow yourself to really digest that reality. Your body houses God. I will say it one more time. Your body houses God. The omnipresent, divine God, the maker of heaven and earth, the, the one that speaks and the earth is formed, lives on the inside of you. You house God. If we can truly and really grasp this reality, it will revolutionize the way that we live. That's why nothing unclean should ever enter into our bodies. What we watch, what we hear, how dare you take your body and lie down and fornicate when the Spirit of God is enhoused within you. You house the glory and the presence of of God. You are his temple. When we understand this, when we truly understand this, it will change the conversations that we have. I was reading in Numbers, I think it's Numbers chapter 12 the other day, where God is talking to, um, he was, so Miriam um, was, and Lot were talking about um, Moses because they weren't happy with basically who he decided to marry. So they're talking about the man of God, and God's confused. He says, listen, there's some people where I just appear to them generally, I'm paraphrasing here, generally, but this is someone that I talk with face to face. This is someone that I call friend. How do you think it's okay to put your mouth on his name? How do you think it's okay to put your name on the man or woman of God? You have no fear. You have no revelation of the, this being. Don't get it twisted. Just because he lives within you doesn't take away his might or his power. With one movement, they can snatch your breath. That power... It's living on the inside of you, and dwelling on the inside of you, but yet we get into foolish conversations. We lay down with sinners and give our bodies away. We are the temple of the most high God. Lastly, 
He guides us how to pray. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Romans 8, 26 to 27. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He teaches us how to pray. For those of you that don't know how to speak in other tongues, it sounds something like this. It's a spiritual language. It's what we, what we say when our, when our minds and our hearts don't understand what to pray. The Spirit himself begins to speak utterances from our mouth so that we can pray effectively. So that when we pray, it's like an, a, a, an arrow um, hitting the target each and every single time. In Acts chapter 2 verses 3 to 4, it says, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you don't know, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, if you cannot speak in other tongues, we will pray for you and you will receive the Holy Spirit this, um, this afternoon. Luke 11 says, if you, if you ask for a fish, will he give you a serpent? Some will say that tongues are passed away. When we pray for you, you may feel like I, I, I'm making it up or uh, I, don't know, I, I, I'm, I don't know what I'm saying. It says that the, it's a faith step. When you begin to open your mouth, he says that he will fill it. The Holy Spirit is already living on the inside of you. So cl- lastly, how do we become spirit conscious? We need to ask for him to come and invite him every day. We need to acknowledge him. We need to spend time with him. We need to build a relationship. We need to allow ourselves to be quiet and still long enough to hear him speak to us. And we need to learn to listen. And once we've listened, we need to do what he tells us to do. Amen. I've just got an illustration before we close just to show you what this looks like. We'll go over here, Jerome, there's more space. So there's a lot of things that we could do in our own strength and in our own ability. So I could pick up this chair, I can move it. Can you see? Invite him into the everyday. Yes, I can pick up the chair. Yes, I can sit down. Yes, I can put on my own bag. Yes, I can walk down the stairs. But living a Holy Spirit filled life is in inviting him in to my space each and every single day. Practice the presence of the Holy Spirit. Practice the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's a person and he's knocking at the door of your heart. And he's saying, will you fellowship with me? Will you let me get to know you? Will you let me guide you and lead you? Stop doing it in your own strength and give it to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Stand to your feet. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is here. And he's been speaking to you this entire service. What does it feel like when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you? It feels like someone tugging with an invisible string at your heart. It feels like sometimes your stomach just clenches. That's the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking to you. You might feel hot sometimes. It might even make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes you even will feel like you want to leave. 
because the Holy Spirit's presence is so strong. Don't resist it. That's the Holy Spirit. And He's here today and He's knocking at the door of your heart. And He's saying, will you choose me? Jesus Christ went to the cross and He died one of the most painful, the most shameful deaths just so that you and I could stand before the throne room of grace with boldness. A great price was paid so that you and I could come in our mess, in our imperfection. He said, just come. When we die, we die by ourselves. We're not surrounded by our friends or our family or our praying grandmother. It's just us and God. So I wanna ask you today, are you confident that if this was your last breath that you would go to be with our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? It's so easy and He's made it so simple. He says, if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, then you will be saved. So I'm gonna pray with anybody here that might not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Saviour. I'm not gonna ask you to come up to the front. I'm not gonna ask you to say anything. This is between yourself and God. But what I would like you to do is raise your hand and put it back down again. That lets me know that you want me to pray with you. So I'm gonna count to five. And if that's you, put your hand up and put it down again. If you say, Sarah Jane, I don't know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Saviour, but today I wanna, I wanna give my life to Him. I wanna ask Him to come into my heart. I want Him to be my Lord and my personal Saviour. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm gonna count to five. If that's you, put your hand up and put it down again. One, is there anyone here that will say yes to Jesus today? Two, three, I see your hand, I see your hand. Four, is there anybody else? Don't let this moment pass you by. Online, those watching online, don't let this moment pass you by. Tomorrow is not promised. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Come on, the Holy Spirit is moving. I see your hands. Don't leave this place the same way you came. I see your hand. You can put it down once you've raised it. Four, don't leave this place the same way you came in. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. The Holy Spirit has been drawing you. He's been calling you. You know that He has. Five, have I missed anyone? Have I missed anyone? Pray this prayer with me and mean it with all your heart. Say, Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart, to be my Lord and to be my personal Saviour. Forgive me, Lord, of every sin. I dedicate my life to you from this day forward. Indwell yourself in me. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, this is Brother Seth. He's got a Bible for you. He wants to put this in your hand. He wants to um, have a conversation with you if you'll allow him to. If you've got any questions, he's a great person to ask. Please see him before you leave today, amen. Amen.